Hey fellas, how's it going? Welcome back to BTM to the Basketball Time Machine, the podcast with former NBA players about former NBA players. Before we get to today's guest, just a little reminder, if you want to hear more podcasts like this one, just make sure you hit that subscribe button so you always get notified once we upload a new podcast. All right, so let's go. Today's guest played in the NBA from 1987 until the mid-90s. Ron Grandison, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Ron, who was your favorite player as a child? Uh, George Gerby. Ooh, the Iceman. The Iceman, yeah. <laughs> yeah, How he come? was my favorite player. He was uh, just smooth on the court, um, just moved real nice, smooth and slow. He wasn't real fast, wasn't real athletic, but very, very skilled basketball player. I uh, had a chance in my first NBA game, I went down to uh, see the Lakers play. And uh, back then, I was a pretty big Lakers fan, but uh, I, was, I was a bigger George Gervin fan. He, and he gave him like 33, man. So it was just an amazing feat. I just loved the ice, man. He was a good player. So you practiced the finger roll a lot? Uh, no, I didn't practice a lot. I just like to see it. <laughs> I wasn't as skilled as he was, man. He was a skilled basketball player. All right. So the Lakers were your all-time favorite team or... Um, I, I was a Laker fan. I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, I spent all my you know, younger years there. I was a Laker fan and then uh, kind of changed a little bit when the, the Showtime kind of left where, you know, Magic and Kareem, Worthy, Byron Scott, they all went out. And uh, it was just it was that was just an amazing group of guys. Amazing team. The way they played. I loved it. Pat Riley, beautiful, you know, type basketball. And uh, so I was a fan in, in the 80s, yes. All right. Uh, you were drafted in 1987 by the Denver Nuggets in the fifth round. How nervous were you going into the draft? Oh, wow. That that was an amazing experience. Um, there, you know, I was a pretty decent college player. I was a hard worker, wasn't the most skilled player, but I did pretty well. Uh, played on the team at University of New Orleans. We were 16th in the country. Uh, we, let's see, our, my senior year, we went to uh, the big dance. Uh, we were 26 and four, and people were talking about, hey, you're going to get drafted, you're going to get drafted. And, you know, I was, you know, I, I always wanted to play professional sports, but I never thought that I would be drafted into the NBA. And so I saw a couple of scouting reports that said, hey, he's going to be drafted in, you know, second round. Uh, and then my um, athletic director talked to me and said, hey, you might be a sleeper in the first round. They're asking for film, things like that. And so draft day was a real disappointment for me, to be honest. Um, when I went in the fifth round, I was just devastated. I thought that, uh, you know, I went to two of the top three pre-draft camps with the top, you know, 100 players in the country. And I thought that I was going to go higher. And sure enough, uh, I didn't go to the fifth round. But... At the end of the day, it all worked out. I got a chance to play and realize that dream. So it was it was fun. Draft day was tough, though. All right. Yeah, your first team actually wasn't the Denver Nuggets. It was the Boston Celtics. Um, do you remember your first time playing in the Boston Garden? Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely, man. I, I, I'll tell you a little bit before then. Uh, what happened, I went to the Nuggets and I tried out. And my agent was kind of trying to get me to go overseas. And I kept saying to him, man, I want to try this. I want to try this. He said, man, you're fifth round pick. You're not going to make it. So what happened is I went all the way to the last cut. And uh, Doug Moe back then, he was the coach, and he told me, he said, hey, man, you should keep going. And he said, you just got to keep working on your game. So basically I played the CBA, and then I went back to school. Then the next year I went out for the, the, the Boston Celtics, and uh, it was an amazing experience. Uh, like you said, you know, walking on the court – The first day in training camp and seeing all those great players was just an amazing experience for me. And then, like you said, the next step was, you know, making the team. That was just another big step. And then the last thing is playing in the Boston Garden was just incredible. Uh, and I played in the old garden. So it was back in the day with the parquet floor and uh, all the dead spots and all the things that the guys remember back in the 80s. <laughs> um After being one of the best teams in the 80s, the Boston Celtics were, yeah, let's say past their prime. Bird was hurt and, and many stars were in the mid-30s. How difficult was it for you as a rookie to find your place on that team? Well, it, it actually worked out for me pretty well. Uh, Bird had heel surgeries, I think, our sixth game into the season. And uh, it opened up a door for me to play. So I played 72 games with the Celtics. Uh, 
had a pretty good rookie season being a guy that got drafted in the fifth round and, uh, you know, not making the team the first year and all of a sudden finding the spot. So it was a good situation for me. I had a great experience in Boston. The guys were amazing. I tell you, this, those guys were so professional. They carried themselves in the right way. They had a winning tradition. So as a rookie, I really learned it the right way, and I was excited to be there. Reggie Lewis emerged that season. Unfortunately, a couple of years later, um, he passed. But could you do me a favor and, and tell especially our younger listeners how good Reggie was and that he was going to be one of the best players in the league? Yeah, I tell you, man, um, I, I was good friends with Reggie. Reggie and I, Brian Shaw, Ramon Rivas, we all were, were pretty tight. We were the young crew and there was an older crew. So we kind of had our little clique together. And uh, I tell you what, Reggie was probably one of the best basketball players I've ever seen play the game. He was not only a smart player, he was incredibly athletic and skilled. And uh, I'm telling you, um, he reminds me of a Kawhi Leonard, to be honest. Uh, Reggie was like Kawhi Leonard. He was just an up and coming guy. And uh, we played against uh, the Bulls back when the Bulls was that big, huge dynasty. And, and Reggie gave Michael Jordan like 36 points. And it was amazing. I mean, he just went at him. And so Reggie definitely was up and coming. It was a very, very sad story. I'm, you know, I'm sad for him and his family and everything. It's just a tough thing to see a guy like that with so much potential and skill you know, all of a sudden not be around anymore. So, but Reggie would have been one of the all-time greats in the NBA. So you played with many, yeah, not only Hall of Famers, but some of the best players to ever play the game, Kevin McHale, Larry Bird, and so on. Um, who of the guys was the player that impressed you the most from, from, let's say, the older generation? Yeah, well, you know, playing with Larry Bird was probably one of the, the best experiences I've ever had. Um, he was amazing. And, and, I, and here I'm a guy coming from LA. So it was the LA Boston thing. And I didn't really care for the Celtics, to be honest. And so I got a chance to see Larry Bird up close and to watch him perform like he could perform. It was amazing. I mean, he wasn't very talented. He was one of those guys that just worked his tail off. He, he, he didn't jump very high, didn't run very fast. But I tell you what, he could shoot the ball like crazy. Uh, he could make incredible passes on the dime. He just was a very smart, skilled basketball player. So having that experience, seeing him every day, seeing him work like he worked. Uh, I remember shooting basket, uh, shooting after uh, he had his heel surgeries and I uh, he, he wanted to shoot some uh, hoops after practice. And I tell you what, man, we probably shot for about two and a half hours and I got to a point where I was done. I couldn't shoot anymore and he kept going. And so It was amazing. Bird was one of those guys that you just have to appreciate. The more you knew him, the more you appreciated how good he was. So just an incredible talent. So playing with him was amazing. But I tell you what, the era that I played in, I mean, the, the Barclays, the Dominique Wilkins, the, you know, the Isaiah Thomas. I mean, these guys, man, were just phenomenal. And I, and I you know, I look at the game today and we got phenomenal players here, but I don't know if, if they can match the guys of, the, of that time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Um, as you already mentioned, you played in an era with the best players to ever play the game. I think that the mid to late 80s and the early 90s is probably the best decade when it comes to basketball talent. Um, do you remember your your most exciting game in your rookie season, like like a game where you were super excited playing against a special player? Um, let's see. Rookie year. Uh, I was, you know, really excited to go up against Charles Barkley. Uh, he was a young guy at that time, too. Uh, talk about a force. The, the guy was just amazing. And they ran this one play where he set a screen in the middle of the lane. And what happened is Hersey Hawkins, I don't know if you remember him, he would of come course. off that screen and he'd shoot that ball, man. And Barkley would just stand in the lane. So... All of a sudden, when Hersey Hawkins shot the ball, here I am. I got to move this guy out of the lane. And I just couldn't do it. I mean, he was just too big. And so he missed the shot. Hersey Hawkins missed the shot. Barkley got the rebound, scored the bucket. Uh, Coach Jimmy Rogers called the timeout, came to the bench and just railed me. He just went off. Oh, you got to talk about it. He just went off. And I was like, golly. So I went back in the game. And I tell you what. 
I I went after Barkley like nobody's business, man. I was like the little gnat that was bothering him the whole game. I said, I'm not ever getting railed on like that from the coach. I'm not going to let him get another rebound the whole entire game. <laughs> so I tell you what, after the game, he was trying to find out who I was. <laughs> so wow. It was fun. <laughs> Uh, I sometimes have the feeling that, especially the uh, the younger generation that never saw Barkley play, they just know him from NBA TV. Um, I think over time people forget what a beast Charles, Bar uh, Charles Barkley was in his prime. That guy was special. I mean, Barkley was probably at that time was probably over 300 pounds and six. Probably they say he's six six, but he's probably about no. six four. Yeah. But, 300 pounds. I mean, you couldn't move the guy. So when he got somewhere, he was going to stay there. And I tell you what, he'd go up and dunk the ball like it was nobody's business at 300 pounds. Yeah, so, I have no idea how he did that. Exactly. So, it, I mean, talk about phenomenal. Talk about amazing guy. Uh, Barkley was, a, was an amazing athlete. Um, after your rookie season, you didn't play in the NBA from 1989 until 90. Yeah, 91, and in 92, you only played uh, three games for the Charlotte Hornets. How difficult was that time period for you? Um, it was real difficult, um, but I'll say this. It, it helped me grow as a basketball player and as a person. Uh, There's a lot of, lot of tough times trying to figure out, you know, what do I need to do? You know, where can I catch on? What can I do? Plenty of times wanted to quit, wanted to just say, forget it, let's go do something else. And uh, just hung with it, man. Just kept playing and, and trying and going after it. And so I, I encourage the guys that play in the D League and the G League now it's, and, and all those things overseas. You know, if you really, you know, want to do it, you know, you got to really go after it and follow your dreams. So at the end of the day, uh, it was a tough, tough low, really, in my career. And didn't know if I was ever going to play again in the NBA. So I was really excited the next time I got that opportunity, and uh, it, it, it was a, a good thing. Yeah, the next opportunity. So in 1995, 1996, you played for Pat Riley in the Miami Heat, uh, yeah. the Tim Hardaway, Alonzo Mourning era. And um, that team was building up to become a powerhouse. What do you remember or what do you recall from that season? Well, the amazing thing was uh, I had went to New York and um, – Riley, it was his last year there, and he asked me to come to training camp, and I made the team with some incredible odds, and, and one of the reasons why is he liked me as a player, and so when he went to Miami, he took me there, so that was when the Knicks would win 60, 65 games a year, they were always in the playoffs, they were contending, and Riley took that team from, you know, not being a very good team to all of a sudden being a powerhouse. So when he went to Miami, he did the very same thing. And I was really excited to go with him to Miami because I knew that Coach Riley was going to make them into a powerhouse. And, uh, you know, we started off that year. I played with uh, the Heat. He actually uh, gave me some playing time. I got on the court. It was great. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I knew that Miami was going to be a successful franchise from there because Pat Riley was at the helm. Yeah, Pat Riley always had a thing for um, hardworking guys, people who actually yeah, work their behind off. Um, but in total, who was the best coach you ever played for? Because you had a couple of Hall of Famers. Yeah. So who is the guy where you say, okay, that was the best coach I ever played for? And, and I have to say Pat Riley, um, just very professional, um, really astute in the game, really uh, – understood what it took as far as on that level to, to perform and uh, helped me a lot. I think that if I would have been a little better as a basketball player, if you had a little more time to work with me, I would probably have stuck for a long time. But I'll say this, a very, very, very close second is Jeff Van Gundy. That's another guy that's uh, amazing basketball mind. That's the kind of guy that you, you can learn from all day long, all the time. And uh, I just enjoyed playing for those two guys so much. They were just uh, the two best coaches I've ever played for. Going back to the 1990s, any team you would have loved to play for? Well, I always wanted to play for the Lakers, uh, in all honesty, uh, just because it's a hometown team. And so back then, uh, you know, it's funny because I always wanted to play for UCLA, too. And UCLA never recruited me. when I, I lived in California, a pretty good basketball player, lived in L.A., and They only recruited the top players in the country. So uh, the Lakers would have been that team. 
uh, to be honest, uh, that was something I dreamed of playing for and uh, unfortunately didn't get the chance to play for him. All right. The next question is a little bit off topic. Um, let's say you would be on a lonely island and you have you have a DVD player and a television there and you're only allowed to take one DVD for the rest of your life. What's it going to be? <laughs> wow. Uh One DVD for the rest of my life. Yes. I'd probably take the the, the movie Shawshank Redemption. Oh, good That's one. That's probably one of my best movies of all time. Uh, I enjoyed that movie. I just thought it was, uh, uh, you know, really well done and uh, was very, 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 uh, how would I say, uh, you, you kept your interest for a long time. I mean, it was a three hour movie and it kept your interest the whole time. So Shawshank Redemption would probably be the DVD I take. Okay, very smart pick. And because I'm feeling generous today, I would say you are also allowed to take a record player and one album. What's it going to be? Oh, wow, man. Now we're going back. Record player and one album. Huh. That's going to be a tough. I'd probably take uh, Tina Marie. That was probably my favorite artist growing up when I was younger. Wow. I thought she had a very, very good voice and showed a lot of range. Also, she showed a lot of versatility with it, too. So probably Team Marie. All right. Um, yeah, your basketball career is behind you. And talking about behind you, I'm seeing your jerseys hanging on the wall in your office, and I'm hearing basketball sounds. So I read that you're doing those 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 basketball cans for, for kids in general. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. Um, when I, The funny thing is I finished playing basketball in uh, – when I was 35 and it, you know, like I said, I had a journeyman career. So, you know, there was times where I didn't have a job and had to just make it through. So I didn't make a whole lot of money over my career, but I did have a great experience. Um, after I got done, it's like I'm 35, I have an accounting degree. What do I do now? And so what happened is I started to do um, some camps and started to do some things with my church And uh, we started, they had a basketball gym there. So I started training some kids and started to like it. And I was like, man, this is pretty cool. So when I, um, uh, after about a couple of years, I said, you know what? I want to try to do this full time. And so I took that on full time. Now I have a uh, three court facility here. And what I do now is I teach and train young kids how to play uh, the game of basketball. And so um, we're in the process of expanding. And uh, looking at getting into a six court facility, a bigger facility, and uh, I enjoy my job. I really do. It's been a great, um, um, great next step to, you know, playing, then to coaching, and then to training. So I'm excited to be able to work with kids and act, and actually give them the right perspective on what they should do with sports and and how they should handle themselves, things like that. Because we don't just teach basketball. We actually teach life lessons through sports. Teach them how to, you know, work hard. Teach them how to set goals. Teach them how to, you know, be respectful to authority. Teach them how to handle adverse situations, things like that. All this happens in sports. And I'm just glad I have a chance to mentor young people. Okay. If kids are interested in joining your camp, how can they find you? Yeah, they can find me on rgbasketball.com. It's uh, Ronnie Grandison or rgbasketball.com. Uh, we work with all ages and we work with all kinds. Trust me, I think that everybody should have a basketball experience in their life or a sports experience in their life. And, uh, you know, we work with uh, beginners. We work with three and four year olds. We work with, you know, uh, high school kids. We work with college kids. So we try to work with anyone we can to help them have a good experience. But it's rgbasketball.com. Wonderful. Ronnie, thanks for being on the show. No problem, man. Thank you for having me.